Today's reading comes from the book of James, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. This is, uh, this is out of the New International Version of Scripture. Submit yourselves to God. What causes, what causes fights and quarrels amongst you? Do they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture say, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near you. Watch your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. These are the scriptures revealing the word of God to the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please, be seated. You know, as time goes on, You just can't help but notice that people are getting uglier to one another. That they are nasty to one another. It seems like everybody wants to fight and quarrel about everything and anything anymore. I mean, if you go on to, you know, like Facebook or X or any of the other social medias. That's all it seems to be. It's quarreling and fighting amongst each other about the silliest things. I mean, it, people just quarrel about what kind of jelly to put on a PB&J, you know? And they'll get nasty about it. Do we have to fight and quarrel on a daily basis, people? We don't, but some people do. It seems that some people are always looking for trouble or they think they're always right about everything. Haven't you met somebody like that? Little Miss Can't Be Wrong or Mr. I Know Everything? Yeah. And, and, and they, they think they're always right about everything, so it's easy for them to get into a quarrel with others because you don't know what you're talking about. you got to listen to me because I know everything. Our text this morning is about fighting and quarreling. Why do people fight and quarrel? Well, there's lots of reasons. In our text, it gives us a little bit more insight about the quarreling. So my proposition this morning is I want to go over what causes fights and quarrels. At least three reasons. There's more, but we'll go over three of them this morning. Those three reasons are the wrong desires, wrong directions, and wrong motives. Let's start with wrong desires. Verse 1 says, What causes fights and quarrels amongst you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? People to desire something is to crave something or to want something. And, something, and sometimes our cravings are evil. They come right from Satan himself. Mark 4.19, Jesus said, The worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Again, Romans chapter 7, verse 8 says this, But sin, seize, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covenant desire. Romans 8, 5, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature desires. 
But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Again, Romans 13, 14, rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful natures. Once again, Galatians 5, 16, so I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of a sinful nature. Do you think the Bible has much to say about the subject? What things, what things do you desire in this world, people? We could make a very long list, couldn't we? We could make a regular laundry list. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe, the blonde bombshell of ages past, is quoted as saying, I don't want to make money. I just want to be wonderful. I think we all know that she was kind of a messed up lady. To be wonderful, to be wonderful or to appear wonderful to all people is a matter of what? Human pride. Human pride. And many people, oh, they love the limelight of life, don't they? Look at me. Theodore Roosevelt. It was said that Theodore Roosevelt was sometimes known as Roosevelt the First. He was the president who knew his value. He did not cheapen himself by underestimating it. Listen to this. Father always had to be center of attention, said one of his children. When we went to a wedding, he wanted to be the bride. When we went to a funeral, he was sorry he couldn't be the corpse. How nuts is that? Proverbs 16.8 Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Again, 1 Peter 5.5 5. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, most people would prefer to have more money. Most people would prefer to have more money. I got to agree with what Will Rogers said. Will Rogers said, too many people spend money they hadn't earned to buy things they don't want to simply impress people they don't like. <laughs> I'm sure this is true for some people. It's called keeping up with the Joneses, right? Often in life we want things that other people have perhaps thinking that what they have will make us happy. Benjamin Franklin wrote, He that is of the opinion money will do everything may well be suspected of doing everything for money. I like what God says about it. 1 Timothy 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have good food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into the temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. People have all kinds of wrong desires and that's why they get into trouble, at least in trouble with God. But often, their desires make them selfish, which in turn causes what? Arguments and quarrels and fighting. This these desires come from within and must be conquered and or overcome by how? By the power of Christ. By the power of Christ, in order to cease quarreling, Christ, he gives us power to overcome. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56, 57. The sting of, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, 1 John 5, 4, For everyone born into God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 
Let's talk about wrong directions. Wrong directions. Verse 2 says, You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and cover, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask, for, ask God. We sometimes go to the wrong source for what we need in life. We do. Instead of asking God, we go elsewhere. We have wrong directions, or, or we're going in the wrong direction. And going in the wrong direction can lead to some serious consequences. For example, in November of 1975, 75 convicts started digging a secret tunnel designed to bring them up on the other side of the wall of the Stolito prison in northern Mexico. Months later, on April 18, 1976, guided by their pure genius, guided by their knowledge, guided by their own desire, they tunneled up right into the middle of the courtroom which many of them had been sentenced. The surprised judges retur returned all 75 to jail immediately. How misguided or misdirected were they to be able to come up right in the middle of the courthouse? But of course, you know, when you're telling in darkness, I, I guess it would be easy to go in the wrong direction. And that's a really good point. When people live in darkness, rather than the light, they often go off in the wrong direction. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgression, transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived amongst them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Paul is saying that at one time or another, we were dead spiritually because we lived in sin. When a person doesn't know the Lord, they are often controlled by their own sinful desires. What else do they have, right? They follow the ways of the world and even the ruler of the air. Who is the ruler of the air? Satan. Satan himself. And what happens when a person like this gets in trouble? Well, sometimes, sometimes, they come to the Lord. That's a good thing. Sometimes when people get into a lot of trouble, they, they come to the Lord. But sometimes, more times than not, they turn everywhere else and seek the wrong help. I know a man many years ago who was, whose wife was divorcing him. And he was completely broken up over this. And, but, but where did he go for help? He went to some secular marriage counselor who basically said, let her go. Yeah, don't worry about it. There's plenty of plenty of fish in the sea. Just let her go. The guy came to me. And I directed him to the Lord. Basically, I said, you know, the Lord is your only hope. You know? You need to give your life to Christ. But this will not guarantee it's going to save your marriage. I, I can't make any promises there. But you've got to get your life straight with Christ. And eventually he gave his life to Christ. It was wonderful. But his wife didn't come back. Why not? Well, she was controlled by the ways of the world. She was looking for a better man or, or what she thought would be a better man. She was also quite adulterous, quite frankly. And when people are lost, they will often go in the wrong direction for help. But we should know better and do better, people. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first His kingdom and righteousness, and all things will be given unto you as well. I've heard it said, and I believe it, that if we would first seek the Lord about any problem, anything, 
anything that we face in life, that it would be solved a lot better and a lot quicker. But often, we don't do this. You know, prayer and seeking the Lord sometimes is the last thing we do instead of the very first thing we ought to be doing. Too many people, they, 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 they treat prayer like, like, you know, they don't, they don't treat it like a steering wheel, they treat prayer more like a spare tire. What I mean by that? Do you wait till you have a flat tire problem to pray? Or do you continuously seek the Lord in your life and let Him do the driving? You know? What, Carrie Underwood had that song, Jesus Take the Wheel? Brings us to wrong motives. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. There's a little poem that was going around a while back. I want to share it with you this morning. It's called, Some Go to Church. Some go to church just for a walk. Some go to church to laugh and to talk. Some go there to, with the time to spend. Some go there to meet a friend. Some go there for speculations. Others go there for observations. Some go there to doze and nod. And some... How few to worship God? Why do you go to church? What's your motive? Do you go for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? What do I mean by that? Give me an example. I remember while preaching in one church that a man and his family joined the church. And and, and and it wasn't long that after he joined the church, he was calling members of the church to sell them some sort of insurance. Now, I, I don't, he didn't stay in the church for very long, only a few months. And I called him up after I didn't see him for a while. I said, well, why did you leave the church? He said, hey. I said well, there's, I don't know about your church. I, I don't know if it really fits us or not. Well, honestly, I, I know that wasn't the problem. You see, he sold as many insurance policies as he could to the people of that congregation. So he quit our church just to go to another church. And he started selling them insurance. That was his MO. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. Now listen to this, people. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. The Lord knows. <laughs> the Lord knows everything. The Lord knows those who are His. The Lord knows those who truly belong to Him. The Lord knows our motives for coming to church and claiming to be Christian. Does that bother you or encourage you? I pray that encourages you. Now, I'll, I'll admit that I've been preaching for, you know, about 30 years now, and I've seen a few people in some churches that I really wondered about. I'm sorry to say that, but i got to be honest. I wondered whether they really knew God and if their faith, or if their faith was just some sort of a front for something else. You see, some people want to be the big fish in the little pond. And they find that coming to a church, they can, they can do that. But 1 Timothy 5, 24, uh, verses 24 through 25 says, The sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. Point is, nothing is hidden for, to God, not our lives, not our thoughts, and certainly not our motives. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasure. When you pray and ask God for something, what's your motive? During the minister's prayer on one Sunday, there was a loud whistle from him back in the back pews. I mean a loud, shrill whistle. 
And Gary's mother, he was, she was horrified, and she pinched him into silence. And at the church, Mom asked, Gary, what made you do such a thing? And Gary answered uh, soberly, well, I asked God to teach me to whistle. And he just then did. <laughs> I doubt it. I don't think he did, and I don't think God did. What we what <laughs> we have heard people joke about about something you know someone asking God to win the lottery or to win something similar. Now, honestly, people, come on, honestly, you know that if somebody's buying lots and lots of of lottery tickets. And that person gets on their knees and they pray to God, Oh, Lord, let me win the lottery. I want to be rich. God's not going to answer that prayer. You do realize that, right? Some people live for pleasure. And I guess some would even dare ask God for God's help to get them all the pleasure in life they can have. However, 2 Timothy 3, 4 speaks of those who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The two are opposite from one another. We need, we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine our faith. Why do we do what we do in life? Why do we ask God for anything? What is the motives behind it? <clears throat> Let me conclude with this. What causes fights and quarrels? We may not always know these, but we should know how to stop them. And there's really only one way to stop all the fighting and the quarrels, and that is to seek the Lord. To do His will. To yield in obedience to His word. When we strive to, to do His will, He will empower us. Empower us to be overcome. Amen. Amen.